So let's marshal some space elves and send them out in a quest to rid the galaxy of chaos and usurpers. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking Eldar and going through all the craft worlds that you can choose to play in Warhammer 40k. When picking an army, if you are choosing to go down the route of one of the storied craft worlds, it's really quite a big decision for an Eldar player. So in this video we'll talk over the lore of each one, how they tend to fight, and what they do on the battlefield in their current rules form. We'll go through the five major craft worlds, then some minor craft worlds and custom craft world traits, and talk a bit about the Inari. I'm sure most Eldar players will be well familiar with the concept of craft worlds, but for those who haven't come across them before, they're essentially Eldar that fled the fall of their species, as the rest of their race slid into depravity and despair, a few crafted great spacefaring vessels, and exiled themselves from their species, wary of what might befall them. When the fall of the Eldar came and the Chaos God Slanesh burst into existence, the vast majority of the Eldar race was destroyed in an instant, the craft world has perhaps been the most notable survivors of their old species, though their dark kin the Drakari and the enigmatic Harlequins both escaped via the webway. Being so isolated, each of these craft worlds very much has its own culture and traditions, so let's take a look at how they differ. First up we have the Beotan, perhaps one of the most highly militant craft worlds, actively aiming to reclaim the stars from those that have usurped them, and restore the proud glory of the Eldari race once more. The Eldar of Beotan are often openly hostile to other species, including those that they don't really need to pick fights with, but see it as their duty to purge and destroy interlopers in their maiden worlds. Because of this high focus on militancy, there are many aspect warriors amongst Beotan, with near every shrine being represented in abundance for the various facets of the bloody-handed god. In more recent times, Beotan has been subject to a catastrophic demonic incursion, with the combined forces of Scarbrand and the Mask of Slanesh running rampant through the craft world, with their salvation only coming at the hands of the Inari and the birth of the Avatar of Inid. When they make war, the Beotan employ a strategy known as the Sword Wind, overwhelming lightning fast force striking at one area of the battlefield, utterly overwhelming the foe, and obliterating a key chunk of the enemy army before they have chance to strike back. Many shrines of aspect warriors are deployed in concert to the battlefield, from the backs of grav tanks and assault vehicles, clad in their classic white and green livery, which often supports a thorn motif. Notable amongst the craft world are the court of the young king, a grand council of exarchs, who few can stand before in battle, and who bear the burden of awakening the avatar of Cain, sacrificing one amongst their number if the craft world's need is truly dire. In game, the Beotan aren't exactly one of the strongest craft worlds, unfortunately. Their unique attribute gives them aspect warrior leadership, and also shuriken weapons get to reroll hit rolls of one. Not a terrible buff, but it's only going to help some of your units. Perhaps one of the most interesting things about them is that their autarchs can be really quite powerful allowing you full rerolls to hit for one unit, which does significantly amp up their damage output. They also have a stratagem to give Aspect Warriors a big boost, which gets even better when they're near an avatar of Kane. And they have two relics in a relic blade that's a little bit underwhelming to be honest, and some spirit stones that can help out Farseers. If you like the idea of leading a host of Aspect Warriors to reclaim the galaxy though, then Beotan could be the craft world for you. Next up we come to the Jetbite Mounted Bloodred Eldar of Same Han. In the background, these guys are a large craft world, famed for their tribal traditions and wild rider jet bike clans. These clans compete in acts of speed and daring, and are famed to be more hot-headed than most Eldar, perhaps engaging it with the enemy with a bit less thought than some of their rivals from other craft worlds. They respect a little more of gained wisdom rather than learned lore, with the Eldari serpent rune being prominent amongst the craft world, and same Han itself meaning the quest for enlightenment. Same Han was one of the first craft worlds to abandon their former empire before the fall. In battle, the Windrider jet bike hosts of Same Han are rightly feared, with every warrior moving at lightning fast speed, blasting forward at breakneck speeds to engage with the enemy, and withdrawing before there's any chance for retaliation. Typically, every warrior will be mounted on a jet bike, viper, or a grav tank of some sort, lending their formations as a whole absolutely matchless agility. In game amongst the craft worlds, their traits are quite interesting. Innately, same hand models can reroll charges, and anything with the bike keyword can advance and shoot heavy weapons as if they were assault weapons. Can be good news for things like Viper jet bikes, which are just going to be moving ridiculously quickly. Perhaps the other most interesting aspect of same hand is their stratagem. For one command point, warriors of the raging winds can be really helpful. That can allow you to advance and charge, and also reroll ones to hit on the charge. It combos very nicely with units like shining spears, which can move 22 inches, and then also charge and re-roll that charge if they don't manage to get it. 
With those sort of powerful combos, there's not going to be a lot of space that's safe on the entire board for the opponent. For their leaders, the warlord trait is a little bit underwhelming, heroic intervention and an extra attack against characters, but their Nova Lance relic is quite good. A jet bite mounted same hand Autar can have a strength of 8, AP minus 4 and damage 2 on the charge, and also get extra damage on 6s. If you'd like to command a host of Eldari with absolute breakneck speed and matchless agility, then maybe same Han is for you. Next we come to the Ghost Warriors of Ayandan. This craft world initially started out not so different from Beotan, relentlessly purging the galaxy of all threat of chaos, and cleared much of the eastern fringe of its taint. Unfortunately, Ayandan was caught unprepared for the Tyranids of High Fleet Kraken, in their prize not realising just how great the threat was until it was far too late. The monstrous fleets overran the entirety of the craft world, and it was only via the grace of the exiled Prince Iriel returning with his Corsair fleet and his taking up of the Cursed Spear of Twilight that they were able to drive back the aliens. This victory was Pyrrhic though, as now Iandan is heavily reliant on Ghost Warriors, with Wraith Guard, Wraith Lords and Wraith Knights making up the majority of their battle hosts. It's not without great sadness that the Spirit Seers recall their ancestors from beyond the grave, but it remains the sole way that the craft world can survive. In game, Iandin can stoically endure more punishments than some of the other craft worlds. They also pass combat attrition techs and have double wounds on vehicle damage tables. Their warlord trait can give them an extra deny the witch against enemy psychic powers, and their stratagem guided wraith sight can allow them to have full rerolls to hit against targets that are nearby a spirit seer. Perhaps the single best thing that Iandin has to offer in game is their relic, which is called the Citronome. You can activate this on a wraith construct unit nearby. They'll take D3 mortal wounds but they get double attacks in the fight phase. It can be absolutely monstrous in combination with Wraith Blades. Finally, they do of course have their own special character in Prince Iriel, who's quite a cheap named Autark at 85 points, and he's fairly fighty with that Spear of Twilight. He is a little bit easier to kill than some of them though, as his curse makes him reroll all past saves of a 6. Overall, if you're willing to muster an army of Wraith Constructs, and have the guts to take on the amount of yellow needed for a Andin, then it could be the craft world for you. Moving on, we come to the Star Striders of Alaytok. Alaytok is an aloof and puritanical craft world, holding their fellows somewhat in disdain, and practicing purity and work above all other values. The very strict codes can grate against even the Eldar psyche, and it has led to many more Eldar choosing to tread the path of the outcast. While this might deplete the numbers somewhat of the craft world proper, it does have its own advantages, and the craft world of Alaytok perhaps has the widest influence of any, their spy networks and ranger agents spanning the entire galaxy. In battle, Elatog is a frustrating foe to fight against, making stealth and misdirection their order of the day. Outriders are picked off with ease by merciless volleys of sniper fire from rangers and pathfinders, and they make great use of holo fields and redeployment to be able to outwit their foes. The enemy will always be on the back foot, being bled dry until they're ready for the final strike. In game, Elatog have perhaps one of the strongest craft world innate benefits, getting minus one to hit from ranged weapons outside 12 inches. It used to be absolutely monstrous in 8th edition when it stacked with various things like minus 1 to hit from stratagems or on flyers, though in 9th it's not quite as strong anymore as that is obviously no longer the case. Still though, it does tend to mean that their units will take a lot more guns to take them down compared with other craft worlds. Otherwise, they have a warlord trait that allows them to auto pass morale for units nearby. The shift shroud allows a character to deep strike if you'd wish, though again I'd say one of the strongest attributes is their stratagem, which can make one unit of rangers only ever be able to be hit on sixes against enemy ranged fire. Unless the opponent's got absolutely tons of anti-infantry fire, then one unit of rangers just won't be going anywhere at all, and that can be really quite disruptive if they were on a key objective, or your opponent did have nothing else to shoot at. Finally, Alatok do have a unique character in Illic Nightspear. He's a 70 point character who is an elite sniper. He wounds infantry on a 2+, plus with an AP-3, damage 3 gun. In general though, I don't tend to see him run all that much, without quite a lot of range support, he is going to struggle to down characters on his own. Overall though, if you like rangers, shadowy and misdirecting Eldar, and your units not being able to be killed at long range very well, then a Latok could be a good choice. Last but not least, out of the great craft worlds, we come to Ulthwi. Ulthwi has long had the moniker Ulthwi the Damned, due to their long proximity to the Eye of Terror braving the insidious chaos influence in order to keep the forces of the Dark God in check. Perhaps as a result of this, they have a great number of psychers amongst their number, and their seers and warlocks are without peer amongst the ranks of the Eldar. Eldrad Ulthran is known as one of the greatest farseers in the entire Eldar race, and was instrumental into the awakening of Inez, and many other key events over the course of the Eldar recent history. 
Ulfwe is committed with its mission to victory over chaos at any cost. In battle, it's not surprising that Ulfwe will field a vast number of psychers, often deployed to the battlefield as seer councils, reading the tides of battle and luring the enemy to an awful fate, or just plain off obliterating them with bolts of magic. Ulfwe are famed for their Black Guardian strike forces, having fewer aspect warriors than some of the other craft worlds, with their large citizen soldiery striking out of the webway to great effect. In game, Ulfwe has a nice all round defensive buff in their 6 plus feel no pain, again making their vehicles and infantry tougher. Their warlord traits can allow you to regenerate a fair few command points, always useful. They've got a ghost helm that can amp up smite, maybe a bit more of a niche pick, and their black guardian stratagem costs one command point for plus one to hit with a guardian unit, can be powerful on a really big squad coming out of the webway. Perhaps one of the best reasons though to play Ulfwe is Eldred Ulthron himself. He is an 155 point Farseer who can cast an extra spell and cast most spells a lot more reliably. If you want to lead a brooding black clad host of Eldar into battle and have the best seers in the Eldar race, then Ulfwe could be a good pick for you. So those are the five major craft worlds, but of course it very much doesn't end there. There are many others plying the void and there's nothing to stop you making up your own background for one of your own. A few of the more well-known minor craft worlds are Altansar, once thought lost to the Eye of Terror, but the Phoenix Lord Morgan Ra was able to save them from its clutches. They are treated with open hostility and suspicion by the other Eldar races, who have little faith that they could remain within the clutches of the warp for so long without being irredeemably tainted by chaos. Ilkaith were also known to reside close to the Eye of Terror, and were well famed for being more easy allies with Comera or Mankind, provided they could thwart the machinations of the Dark Gods. Ibrasel is a matriarchal-led craft world with many howling banshee shrines. Their main focus is to recover the artifacts of the crone worlds and help restore the Eldar race to its former glory in that way. And Luganath, with their distinctive orange colour scheme that you can see here, are seen by little more than renegades and raiders by many of the other craft worlds, and they wish to abandon the galaxy entirely and claim the webway as their own domain. In game, their Psychic Awakening book gave them quite a lot of options for custom craft worlds, and I'd argue that these are perhaps the strongest way to play Eldar right now if you wanted to get the absolute most out of them. The way it works is you get to combine any two of these powerful options, and some of them are really quite good. There are quite a lot out there, obviously it's going to depend on what sort of units you're running, but some of my favourites are the ones that are listed here. Expert Crafters gives you reroll to hit and a reroll to wound per unit every time they shoot or fight, so there's a massive damage buff. Masterful Shots allows you to ignore cover, which is really potent in combined with the crafters as a really, really strong shooting army. Masters of Concealment gives them counts as being in cover greater than 12 inches, so extra saving throws, good on vehicles. Wrath of the Dead is great for Wraith units, re-rolling wound rolls of 1. Children of Prophecy amps up Psychers, results of 1 count as 2s on Psychic tests, which is going to add up to a few more past powers. And for a more melee focused Eldar army, Headstrong giving plus 1 to charge is no bad thing. There's plenty more out there, and you can also have multiple minor craft worlds in the same army, say all of your assaulty stuff getting more assault benefits, and maybe more of your shooter units getting expert crafters and masterful shots, for example. Finally, you can also run your craft world Eldar as Inari as well, the recently risen faction of Eldar who worship Inid, the god of the dead. The seers realised that as the Eldar race was dying, this deity had been growing in strength, and between Eldrad Ulthran and Yvrain, Inid is now a fully formed force in the galaxy, leading a combined host of warriors from Craftworlds, Drakari, and Harlequins. I believe out of Craftworld Eldar, the only units that you can't use with them are the Phoenix Lords, and they are locked out of a few other choices, such as special characters and homunculus covens. In battle, the Inari are bloodthirsty and fearless opponents, knowing that even in death, they'll only make their cause stronger. They're boosted and empowered by the death on the battlefield around them, and maybe have a bit more of an affinity for close combat than many of their other craft world cousins. In game, the Inari really have a supplement all of their own right, replacing quite a lot of the craft world Eldar abilities with their own. Their core army ability allows them to use strength from death, which means that if you have one unit that's died on the battlefield, Inari units will get to fight first in close combat, and if they happen to charge as well, then they get plus one to hit. In the Incarn, the Avatar of Inid, Ivrain, and the Vizark. Ivrain is a pretty potent psyker, and the Incarn can be really quite a disruptive threat against your opponent, exploding into life once a unit is destroyed. They have really quite a lot of unique warlord traits, psychic powers, relics and stratagems, too many to really go into when we're focusing on the craft worlds themselves, but in general they do often tend to have a bit more of a melee focus compared with a lot of the craft world options. I wouldn't say that craft world Yanari are amazingly strong at the moment, 
Generally, I think that Inari are probably a bit better as Harlequins or Drakari myself, though it is certainly another interesting option and a way to get a different way to play the same army potentially. Overall, if you're feeling a bit macabre, and you'd like to command fearless hosts of space elves charging into the midst of the enemy, then the Inari could be for you. So that brings us to the end of the list for this video. As always with these overviews, there's far more that we could say about any one of these factions, and I look forward to reading your thoughts and ideas down in the comments. Which craft world would you play, or do you play, and why is it the best? If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, I do generally cover more game related things in Warhammer 40k, though it's quite fun to go over factions like this every so often, and I'll certainly aim to keep it up into the future. Finally, if you have been enjoying the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that I do have a Patreon page that you can find down in the video description. Making all these videos, particularly slightly more in depth ones like this, does take a ton of time, and if you are enjoying regularly, then any support is massively appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, such as seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next, and automatic entry into the prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, then the link is down in the video description below. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.